Hello everyone, I'd like to welcome you to Bentley Gallery, the uh, exhibition called Repetition, featuring uh, two artists, Peter Millette and Jeremy Thomas. Uh, we, are, uh, we have uh, Jeremy Thomas actually here uh, to talk about his work, so I'd like to uh, welcome Jeremy from his studio in Española, New Mexico. Hello Jeremy, how are you doing? Hi, good. Good to hear, good to hear. So I want to ask you a few questions um, in regards to the show Repetition. Um, what processes do you go through to construct these and how does your pieces fit into the show called Repetition? The, the process I use um, is a, it's actually a full procedure that I go through with every piece um, and I apply um, a, a process of, of fabrication and inflation um, to each form. Um, how it works is that I come up with uh, geometric patterns uh, that get cut out. Um, anymore they get cut out with a water jet cutter so they can be very precise. Um, so I come up with the patterns, have them cut, uh, they come back up to the studio, I fold these geometric patterns um, into different shapes they get welded together and then inflated so that's the procedure but the the process is a little more uh involved than that where you where i'm actually using um di the patterns that i'm using either with this show specifically come from um uh, a six-sided form or a hexagon which is a very central form to organic chemistry. And so the pattern is used over and over and over in structures in nature, as well as in synthetic chemicals. Um, and so um, I'm using both a circle, which is a, a pretty basic form, and then also a hexagon. And these get folded and so it's and, and welded together. That um, is that repetitive part is using these same constructs to keep building with. So I'm using the same structures to create different forms. The other is that, the, that's very kind of repetitive, is that I've been inflating pieces for um, almost 17, a little over 17 years. And so the procedure I go through itself is a very repetitive process um, because I'm, I'm basically doing the, a very similar task um, and so I'm, I'm performing this task over and over and over again um, but through that task I'm making different forms and getting different results wonderful yeah they're they're absolutely beautiful and I think that's what sets them apart from anything is when you really investigate the work you see the same pattern over and over and over again in the sculpture itself. So in regards to color and form, um, these two pieces here, I'd like to talk about um, how the size, how you approach the size in your work. Um, you know, like Covestro Yellow is a much larger piece than Aromatic Carbon One. Um, is there any significance on deciding, you know, what form you use and how you go about doing that? Well, when I'm working, um, I work, like I said, through a procedure. And, and so a lot of times I work from small to large where I work out the, the problems and solve the, the, the form on a small scale. And then when I see that that form is, is one that, would work on a larger scale. Not everything works on a larger scale. Um, uh, sometimes I'll scale that up to make a, a larger form, or I may take two smaller pieces and go, you know, I really like this side of this piece, and I really like this aspect of another piece, and then I can put those two together. So the scale allows me on the smaller scale to play with these, uh, these patterns and, and experiment. Um, before I move up into a larger scale. But there's also something that happens in scale um, that 
the smaller pieces because of the scale are much more intimate and so it draws people into them more um, the bigger pieces are, are really more about the form the smaller pieces are about the form but you really get drawn back into the, the surface um, and the color and that uh, even almost the, the, the glossy um, fetish type finish that's on them sometimes. So, um, so with these two, the way I select these colors, um, the colors typically come from um, industries within, within current uh, society. Um, previously, those would be uh, anything from agricultural equipment colors to cosmetic colors. Um, and I've been researching and, and investigating um, color chemistry specifically for quite a few years. And, um, and so I, I've started to investigate and look into different um, uh, references of color that I had been using in the past. So the Covestro yellow is a reference to a, a, a chemical company directly. Um, and so the color is taken from that context and placed onto this piece. Um, and then using the, uh, those carbon rings, those carbon patterns to, to make this form. The aromatic carbon piece, um, those pieces are more about these um, carbon structures, these aromatic carbons that we have and, and are released into the air and into the atmosphere. So the, the, the point of those pieces are more about um, exploring the way that light transmits through air and how we experience it in that color um, on those forms. Um, of course, we're talking about things that are, you know, nanometers wide, and I'm expanding these kind of forms um, up into something that's inches wide. Um, and so it has a, a big difference, but the color very much comes from um, those kind of sources. Um, and how do you, um, I noticed in some of the pieces, there's also an iridescence to them as well, as for instance, uh, this one, uh, P and M orange, and uh, this other one, uh, BAFS green, where you've used actually a forced rust in a green. Um, is, there a, is there a reason why you use uh, one other than the other? Um, yeah, sometimes it's just a, a gut instinct that I just feel these colors um, need to be put together in relationship to form. Um, sometimes it's certain forms just certain colors for me and I, I just have to put that color on it. Um, and so the iridescence though allows or the interference color allows the, that, that form to shift, right? And have a change in the form. So as you move around it, it can shift from a, a blue to a violet and back and forth. Sometimes that references um, a more realistic uh, thing, um, an experience. So uh, a color experience that I've had in an, another context, and I bring that back to the piece. But then also the colors reference um, are, are bringing colors that are used in industry. Um, and in this particular piece, um, it's you know PNM Orange. PNM is actually our um, electrical service provider here in New Mexico, and so I was looking at, I was looking at, and and their trucks have this orange emblem on them, and so I was looking at the uh, the amount of renewable resource that they use to produce the energy and electricity that I use. Um, and how much of that is used uh, um, is derived from um, is derived from coal. How much of it is derived from uh, renewables? How much of it is derived from natural gas? And um, and so kind of in that investigation um, and kind of looking at what I use, um, this piece kind of came from that. 
So um, with the piece that's uh, BASF uh, green, the contrast is really about that contrasting color. So we have the high gloss powder coat green color that's contrasted with this matte surface um, of a rust uh, or patina. And so that you, you heighten the, the experience of both by putting those two surfaces together, but they really start talking about um, fault surface to real surface, natural to synthetic, um, and those kind of ideas um, are brought up, even though they aren't talked about directly. Um, they're abstract ideas that lets the viewer to investigate those concepts on their own terms. So. Yeah, that color shift in uh, P and M orange is just absolutely gorgeous. I mean, it is really, really striking how you walk by it and you really are. Uh, interacting with the piece with the change of color in it. It's just absolutely gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. Well, thank you. I, I think the, the goal is to get people to interact with the work and respond to it on a visceral level so that then they can start to investigate it on a cognitive level, right? I mean, you have to really um, be caught by a, a work of art first emotionally. It has to engage you somehow. And then after you're engaged, then you can start thinking about it. Um, so much work anymore is solely about um, just engaging your mind, right? And, and thinking about ideas and, and problems or solutions, but they aren't engaging your, your experience, your emotion, your, um, uh, your spirit in any way. And so you really need that, um, that visceral response. And sometimes, you know, us as humans, we're a little like, we're a little like fish. If it's shiny, we like it, right? We kind of like, whoa, um, this is, it's this shiny color, I have to look at it. And so that's a way of getting people to engage with the work, um, as well as it can be quite beautiful. Yeah. And what, uh, what artists, if any, uh, interest you? Are any um, influence your work? So, you know, um, art in general isn't what influences the work the most. Um, it's experience and, and places I've gone and colors I see, forms I see out in the world that really influence the work the most. Um, things I read, I read quite a bit. And so there's a lot of books that have and, and uh, writings that influence the work. Um, there's a lot of artists that I love. You know, there's a lot of work out there that, that I just absolutely love. Um, but it's not truly a direct influence in, in what I'm making. Um, but the things that do influence me tend to be the artists that I act with. Um, that are, are either friends or acquaintances, and those interactions and those discussions tend to affect the work more directly than walking into a museum and seeing some big name whoever. Um, it might be interesting, I might really love the work, but it really doesn't affect how I produce my own work or how I, I view how I make my own work. So. Um, so it's, it's kind of, for me, um, it's not a direct influence. I mean, I can go back to more older historical work that influences the work. Um, you know, work from the paintings from, from the, the 15th century or, or, or sculptures from the, the 13th century that really influenced the work for me personally more so than anything contemporary. So. So as you as an artist um, producing this, uh, these, all of these sculptures are your, like, your little babies, you know, that you're putting out into the world and everything. So what's like the most important thing that you want people to get when they're experiencing uh, your works, especially like an exhibition like this where, you know, they can view so many of them together and talking to one another. Right. Yeah, there's, um, there's a couple things that I really want people to experience. One, I want them to experience 
the, the pressure involved, the air involved with making the piece, um, that the work isn't about purely the steel and the color, that it's about the air as well. And so I, I hope that they, they start to understand that through seeing the work um, and start to investigate the process. But also, um, I really, I prefer, I really would like people to walk away um, in a, with some sort of change state. Um, you know, there are some people that are going to see the colors and it's going to change their mood, change their experience, um, give some levity, bring some beauty. Um, there's so much out there in the world that we worry about, stress about, and are, are so such intense ideas that um, bringing some beauty and some color and some life and giving a place for people to, um, uh, ideas for people to rest with, um, if, that, if they can accomplish that, if you can accomplish um, giving somebody, um, bringing some beauty into their own life, then that's really what the goal is for me um, with these particular pieces. There are really more serious ideas that I'm working with um, within the context of the work, but, um, but I don't want to approach those as, um, as, I want to approach them as an investigation so that people can come to their own conclusions on those because they have their, their right to come up with those conclusions. Um, and they may be different than my conclusions, but in the same time, the color and the form, if that brings some beauty, brings them a point where they can be reflective about uh, what's going on in the world around them, bring them to a different point, then, then I'm being successful in, in what I'm, I'm trying to accomplish. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, you've actually had your first show uh, 10 years ago with, uh, with Bentley Gallery. Um, so has your work evolved uh, since, you know, having your show 10 years ago uh, from, from today, from this show? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think about 10 years ago, and I think where the world was 10 years ago, um, a lot of things have changed, you know? Um, 10 years ago, I think the iPhone was only two years old, you know? And, and so when you think about it in those terms, it's like a lot has changed in 10 years. I mean, our whole entire existence, the way we do things is different. Um, and so if I was making the same work now as I was then, um, I, heaven forbid, but um, you know, the work is similar. <laughs> you know, there's, there's the connecting line of the procedure I go through, right? The big difference, I think, for me as an artist between the work now and then, I've investigated a lot of different things through those 10 years. But the biggest change is the way that I view the work. 10 years ago, um, I think I thought about myself and the work as... Um, First of all, myself as a, as a metal worker, as uh, somebody who was grounded in almost a, a process or a craft. And, um, and over the years, I think that's evolved. But what I've learned from the work is that the work isn't about the steel that I use as much as it's a, really about the air that I use in the steel. And the work is becoming more and more about the air than it is about the, the metal. Um, and so it's, that's really the medium that I'm playing with is more atmosphere and air. And so that's what's driving the work now and driving the ideas behind the work. As opposed to before, it was always about object and steel um, with their relationship to the earth and with their relationship to the ground. Um, and that's changed quite a bit. So, um, so those, that's really the, the main conceptual idea behind it that's really changed. Um, the process has changed as well. Before I was doing everything with a hot process. Um, I think that 10 years ago, the first show, um, I think the first exhibition was probably half 
cold inflated work and half hot inflated work. And so I was still working directly in the forge quite a bit. Um, almost all of the work now is inflated without using a furnace. Um, and so the, the procedure has changed and evolved and um, the research and, and development that I've done to be able to, to figure out how to do that um, safely is, is really evolved over the years. So anymore, most of the work is actually a steel envelope that's welded up and then inflated without using a furnace, without using any heat at all. And um, so the work, it changes the form slightly, um, but it allows me to change, it allows me to not be confined to that furnace, um, which was always a limiting factor. Um, that it had to fit inside this forge and now they don't have to fit inside that forge so it really opens up the the uh the vocabulary i can use much broader yeah it um i mean i think that's really a key point in your work that most people don't get to see so i am going to encourage people to go to bentleygallery.com uh, on uh, Jeremy's page, there's some videos that actually show uh, his process in it actually being uh, inflated and produced, which is really cool. Or YouTube or Vimeo as well. I uh, have some great documentaries on Jeremy Thomas's process. So uh, please visit those and see those. Um, Jeremy, so I have to ask you a personal question here. How are you dealing with this whole pandemic going on? It's uh, it's a little weird, um, you know. I'm I'm used to having my studio. It's right here next to the house, and I work here ne next to my home. And everybody goes to work on an average day, and I'm here by myself, and I just work. And I and then when they come home, I stop working. And now everybody's here all the time, and it's a really kind of it throws me off somehow. Um, but it's, it's, I think that's also because there's such a distraction from with what's going on out there in the world. I mean, it's really hard to think about and make these art objects when there's, um, when there's so much suffering that's going on and so much, uh, you know, people that are so much worry and stress and, and anxiety about this pandemic. Um, and, so, you know, it's, it's taken a bit for me to kind of settle in here. For the first little bit, I said, oh boy, I, I, can't, I have to stay home. I'm gonna take care of all of these things that I've been putting off um, around, around the house and around the shop and do maintenance stuff. And I did that for almost two, almost three weeks. And now I'm like, all right, I gotta get back to work. This is making me crazy. I can't do this anymore. And so, um, yeah, I'm starting to get back in the studio more um, and I'm really starting to investigate some new things. I think this gives me the opportunity to, to re really investigate some ideas that I had earlier last year uh, with a kind of a new body of work and, um, and start to work towards those. Um, and we'll see how that develops. So, but it, it's, a, it's different, you know. I, I feel lucky because um, you know, I have some room, I have some space. Um, I've got a, a greenhouse and a garden I can tend to. And so I can kind of get out and, and, and be outside a little bit and, and enjoy that kind of aspect of life. I, I really feel for those people that are stuck in New York in, a, in an apartment that's the size of my office, you know, and have to try to exist that way or uh, any of those big cities where you, you really don't have any access to get out. Um, and so I, I really feel, um, you know, lucky, privileged to be able to, to have what I have so that I can actually walk over and, you know, next door and go into the metal shop and do some work and walk back and, and enjoy the day a little bit. Um, even though I'm, I'm here and not going anywhere, it's a, it's a, it's really, it's, it's a privilege to be able to have that. Absolutely. So. I agree. I agree. It's a, it's an interesting time for sure for you know all the artists and galleries and you know just people in general, you know. So, 
But I would like to thank yeah, you uh, very much for the beautiful show that you've given us. And um, everyone can see it online as we have a short little video online showing the exhibition. So since you can't see it in person, you can always visit it on YouTube or our website. So thank you, Jeremy, so much for uh, taking this time, you know, to be with us during this uh, pandemic and talking about your work and giving us this insight, more insight. So thank you very much. Well, thanks a lot. Thank you, Craig. And uh, yeah, we'll be talking soon. You got it. We sure will.